Hello everybody, this is Rob Chastner and um, on this video uh, I'm going to do the um, eighth and final um, major covenant of the Bible uh, in the series that I did on the eight covenants of the Bible, uh, this being the eighth. And the eighth one is called the New Covenant. And uh, the scripture that you'll find for the uh, the New Covenant is going to be uh, in Jeremiah chapter 31. That would be in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And it's not very long, so I'm going to go ahead and just read the scripture. It says, Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, uh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made um, uh, with their fathers in the day that I look them, uh, sorry, that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says Jehovah. This uh, is the covenant that I will make with them in the house of Israel after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my law in their inward parts and in their heart, and I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man uh, his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Jehovah. Uh, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. And I, uh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin will I remember no more. Now, the participants in uh, the covenant, uh, this is made between God and Israel. And it receives further confirmation in other uh, scriptures, other passages, which I'll uh, include below in the information box. The provisions of this covenant um, are many, uh, so I'll just review them. Uh, first, it's unconditional covenant involving God and both houses of Israel. It says Judea and Samaria, uh, or it says, um, uh, depending upon what what Bible you're, you're reading, it could, it could say uh, in Israel, but it's talking about the northern and the southern kingdoms of uh, both houses of Israel. Uh, secondly, it is a clear, it is clearly distinct uh, from the Mosaic covenant uh, in uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 32. Uh, it is not merely a further elaboration of the Mosaic covenant but it is uh, distinct from it. It is ultimately to replace the covenant made with Moses that was now considered broken. Uh, and you can find um, another video on the Mosaic covenant that gives you the full background and the scriptures on that. The third provision of the new covenant, it promises the regeneration of Israel. Uh, the key aspect of this entire covenant is the blessing of salvation, uh, which include included Israel's uh, national regeneration. So the fourth uh, provision would be the regeneration of Israel to its universe, uh, uh, to be universal among all Jews. And then the fifth is that there is a provision for the forgiveness of sin. Um, we know that uh, sin was uh, there were sin offerings made at the sin, uh, the synagogue. I was going to say, but uh, it was the temple, and the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by um, Titus and the Roman legions. Um, and since that time, there have not been uh, sacrifices. But in fact, the Messiah came during that time before 70 A.D. Um, and uh, he made the one ultimate sacrifice for all the sin of the world. And so therein lies the provision of forgiveness of all sin uh, for anyone who accepts the Lord as uh, the Messiah and acknowledges who he is. The sixth uh, provision is that there is an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, that comes from um, you know your confession of faith in the in the Messiah. And uh, once once you do that, then the Holy Spirit uh, enters you, and and then there's a lot of uh, wonderful things that will happen with that, and you'll you'll begin to uh, to have a, a want and a desire to learn the word and to grow in the word so that you can have a better understanding of who God really is. Um, uh, the seventh is that Israel will be showered with material bless blessings. Uh, eighth, the sanctuary will be rebuilt. Um, we know that Moses, in his covenant, he... Um, he was to build the tabernacle. Uh, David's covenant provided the building of the first temple by Solomon. And the new covenant will provide uh, a building of the messianic uh, temple. Uh, it's referred to in the book of Revelation as the millennium. Um, I think that the uh, thousand year reign that is talked about in, in, uh, in Revelation is probably more symbolic than it is uh, uh, specific to a thousand years, and it's going to be a long, long time, which uh, the, all of the, most of the prophets in the Old Testament refer to the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is what they're talking about in uh, Revelation, the thousand year reign or the millennium. And uh, the, all of those uh, prophets that speak of that say that it's going to be forever. Of course, forever is a long time. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's eternal. It's an eternal um, uh, a time um, that the temple will, will, will reign. And so the ninth provision, just as the Mosaic Covenant contained the law of Moses, the new covenant contains the law of Messiah. Um, I guess the best way to just to, to, to s summarize what that means is, um, uh, when you when you hear about Mount Sinai, that's a representation of when God gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments, and um, that's all about the written law. And when you hear about uh, Mount Zion, uh, that's for the uh, the Messianic age, where there is the wonderful gift of grace, grace being unmerited favor. So uh, those who accept and acknowledge who the Messiah is, they have forgiveness of sin by the grace of God. And so uh, we're talking about um, we're talking about uh, eternal life with sin being forgiven uh, through the grace of God. So the importance of the of this covenant, uh, the new covenant, is that it applies the blessing aspect of the Abrahamic covenant, especially in relationship to salvation. Uh, uh, look, we're all made in the image of God. God's image, in fact, is eternal. So uh, we're all going to be eternal beings. This this tabernacle or this body that we have is a temporary dwelling, a gift from God so that we can live inside of this atmosphere on earth during this some um, 80 or 100 years that we typically live in, in, uh, in this body. And uh, although our body goes back to the dust of the earth, um, the soul and the spirit Again, made in the image of God, God being an eternal being, our soul and spirit will continue on eternally. And whether you um, uh, acknowledge and accept who the true Messiah is, according to Scripture, you're still going to be an eternal being. The difference is that if you if you acknowledge and accept who the true Messiah is, that would be Jesus, Yeshua, from Nazareth, uh, it was clearly pointed out by fulfillment of prophecy in the Bible. And if you accept and acknowledge that, then your eternal being will be with God in grace, forgiven, forgiven of sin. If you are defiant and do not accept 
who the Messiah is. You still are an eternal being, but you'll be eternally separated from God uh, in, in the uh, realm of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Uh, you'll be eternally separated from God in judgment. And um, so that's uh, uh, the, the Bible clearly points out that you'll be uh, living the life of, uh, of the devil uh, with him in eternally separated. So the relationship of the church and the new covenant, um, um, the church age um, essentially would be all who acknowledge uh, the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, as the Messiah. Um, um, it's believers and non-believers. It's not Jews and Gentiles anymore. It's those who believe those are God's people. Okay, so um, I'm going to sum up a few other items and then uh, conclude. Uh, the fact that the Gentile believers have become partakers of the Jewish spiritual blessing blessings places an obligation on them, according to uh, the book of Romans. If you read in chapter 15... Romans 15, verses 25, 6, and 7, it says, But now I say, I go into Jerusalem, ministering unto the saints. For it has been the good pleasure of Macedonia and Achaia uh, to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints that are at Jerusalem. Yea, it, it has been a, their good pleasure and their debtors they, uh, their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of the spiritual things, they owe it to them to minister unto them in carnal things. So, so when the, the Gentiles were grafted in uh, to the spiritual blessings of the Messiah and eternal life, uh, along with that comes the responsibility or obligation to fulfill those things that the Bible says uh, that, that God tells us in, uh, to do. The status of the covenant uh, in relationship to the church, the new covenant is the basis of dispensation of grace. Grace, again, is unmerited favor. And in relationship to Israel, the new covenant is the basis for the dispensation of the kingdom. The new covenant itself is unconditional. It's an unconditional covenant, and therefore, is in effect and will be in effect eternally. So uh, to conclude, a brief summary of the new covenant. And I, again, I will put all of the, uh, the scriptures below in the, uh, in the box of where the information goes. Um, all spiritual blessings are for believers in the Messiah, whether they are Jew or Gentile. And through Yeshua, Jesus' death on the cross, <clears throat> for their sins, believers reap spiritual benefits that would never be theirs otherwise. The eight covenants of the Bible are very explicit in their provisions and are valuable for a proper understanding of Scripture. So, uh, if, if anybody is interested to know what it means to have eternal salvation with grace of God for eternity, uh, you might want to consider, aside from studying scripture, you might want to go specifically to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and read verses 1 through 4. And essentially what it says is, uh, this is written by the Apostle Paul, who was handpicked uh, a Jew. Uh, he was picked by the Messiah, Jesus, to, uh, to spread the gospel of grace, that unmerited favor. And what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, chapters 1 through 4, essentially is that Jesus died for your sins. Whether you accept him or not, he still paid the price for all of those sins. Um, he was buried for three days, 
He rose once again. Uh, that's a representation, by the way, in Leviticus 23 of the Festival of First Fruits, his resurrection, which is celebrated on Easter. Um, first Fruits, the resurrection. He is the, the first one who resurrected from the dead to eternal life. And that is uh, what's going to be for all of those who confess their faith in the Lord. They will resurrect into an eternal being with a renewed and restored body for eternity with the gift of grace, unmerited favor, with all sins being forgiven. And, and those who choose that will, will be with the Messiah uh, for eternity. So uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Jesus died for your sins. He was buried uh, he died on the cross, he was buried for three days, and he rose again, and he is now seated at the right hand of God, and he will return um, to um, to place the judgment necessary on those who are defiant of his messiahship and his deity, uh, and after that, then we'll uh, be celebrating in that thousand-year reign or the millennium, which I believe to be an eternal state of uh, um, uh, during the festival or the feasts of tabernacles where we will have that's the seventh and final festival of the festivals listed in Leviticus 23 and uh, we will rest and we will enjoy fellowshipping with God uh, throughout eternity from that I hope that the um, the study on the uh, eight major covenants of the Bible were helpful and uh, you're welcome to send questions or comments uh, to the email address that I will have up on the screen. And thank you so much for listening. Amen.